reach in your pockets, hopefully, your phone's still there. Our phones do a lot for us. They check the weather, they remind us to turn on our alarm just in case we don't wake up the next morning. But there's one thing our phones can't do yet. Tell us how we are. Hey Siri, how am I doing today? Okay Google, how are my emotions today? See, these seem like ridiculous questions, but with advancements in sentiment analysis and machine learning, our machines are becoming closer to answering these very questions. Let me give you a sentence. I love that movie. And I asked you to rate it out of a 10, with zero being negative and 10 being positive. Now, we'd all agree that this is a pretty positive sentence and give it a round of 10. Let's change the verb a bit. I liked that movie. Here, still pretty positive, but clearly lower on the scale. Now, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. I hated that movie. Now, whoever said this clearly feels negatively about the subject, and so we'd probably give this a round of zero. Now, sentiment analysis is simply using machine learning to teach computers to do just this, extract the sentiments out of our sentences. Now, how does this work? What is machine learning? Machine learning is simply like a function in math. You give it one or many numbers, and it spits out another. In machine learning, these functions are called models. Now, these models are often neural networks that simulate the structures of our brains to, set, to get inputs and their associations to build models predicting future inputs. Now, here's Joe. Who's Joe, you might ask? Joe's our friendly neighborhood machine learning model, of course. Now, we want Joe to tell us whether or not this image is a tiger. See, Joe's pretty sad right now because he has no clue what to do. Here is where we train our model. In order for Joe to tell us what a tiger is and what a tiger isn't, we as humans must need to first tell him what a tiger looks like and what it doesn't. There's a slight problem here, however. Joe doesn't see this image like we do. The one thing Joe can do, however, is interpret numbers. So what we can do is give these images to Joe as a list of numbers, of RGB vectors for each pixel. Now let me break that down. RGB vectors are red, green, blue vectors for each pixel, denoting the color of each pixel in an image. Now, what that effectively allows us to do is convert these images into numbers. That's great. Joe can now understand what we're trying to give him. He knows what he's trying to do. Now what we can do, when given an unfamiliar image, is turn this into RGB vectors, give it to Joe, and hey, what do you know? He thinks it's a tiger. He's 97% sure, actually. So this was the case with pictures, with images, but we're talking about sentences. The thing is, it's exactly the same. How do we turn words into numbers? Now, some of you might be thinking, let's just slap a number on each word and call it a day. But the thing is, if we train our models using those vector inputs, we'd run into a problem. This method struggles to recognize the semantic similarity between words. For example, this method fails to recognize the similarity between a word such as loved and liked as opposed to a low similarity between loved and hated. Here is where we run into one of the most fundamental concepts in sentiment analysis. Word vectors. Now, what are word vectors? Well, they're exactly as they would seem. They're vectors corresponding to each word, much like the RGB vectors for each pixel. 
Now, unlike the RGB vectors, however, these word vectors can span from 25 up to 1,000 components. Now, conveniently, as these vectors are still simply a list of numbers, they can be plotted on an n-dimensional space. But for the sake of visualization and your brains, let's reduce that down to two. On this coordinate plane, what word vectors allow us to do is to demonstrate and evaluate the relationships between words as distances between points. Now, somewhere on this coordinate plane, lion and cat would be near each other, related by their felinity, while somewhere else on the plane, Honda and Ford would be clustered together, related by their car manufacturing status. Now, this seems to be working great. What's the problem? Well, the problem comes in when we add in more words. What would we do about the word jaguar? Now, it is a feline, so does it go somewhere near cat and lion? No, but it is a car manufacturer. Somewhere in the middle, we have no clue. We've run into the dilemma, which makes it possible for word vectors to be multidimensional. By adding more vectors, by adding more dimensions to these vectors, we're able to express the relationships between words in the English language with more nuance. Great, now we have these word vectors, and we can associate them to the words in our sentence, converting them to numbers that Joe loves. Theoretically, now we can feed these numbers to Joe, and Joe will now be able to predict the sentiment of any sentence we give it. So, naturally, I decided to put that to the test. Where would I get my data to train this model? Well, after some searching, I decided to go with Kaggle's Twitter sentiment data set, consisting of 1.5 million tweets, manually categorized by either a zero for negative or one for positive. Now, you might be thinking, hold up, 1.5 million tweets? It's a lot of tweets. And that is true, it is a lot of tweets. But just as you and I would be better at identifying something, the more examples you got of it, Joe can benefit from as much data as we can give it. As for our word vectors, however, I went with Stanford University's GLOVE, Stanford Global Vectors. Now, this word vector set was pre-created which means that these researchers had to go through thousands and thousands of sentences, look at instances for each word, and evaluate their context to create word vectors for each and every word. There was one more step I had to take before I could train Joe, however. Let's look at this tweet. Stopped at McDonald's for lunch. I'm excited. Hashtag nuggets. Now, if we fed this right to our model, we'd see a problem. See, us as humans can see through the Twitter clutter, can see through the various distractions in this tweet. But for Joe, Joe needs a bit of help. And that's why we need to clean this data set. Show you what I mean. The first things to go were punctuation. Along with punctuation, when um, Twitter artifacts, such as mentions, hashtags, and links. Second went, or what are called in natural language processing, as stop words. Words such as as, if, I, and, that don't necessarily add to the meaning of the sentence. Now, finally, and arguably the most tricky part of cleaning this data set was how to deal with internet slang. Now, it's impossible to go anywhere on the internet without encountering some sort of abbreviation, some sort of slang. The tough part about dealing with this is that there is no set way of evaluating these words. Now, to be fair, common words such as lol or LMAO all have their individual entries in word vector sets such as glove. Now, misspellings such as the one we see in this tweet here can be caught with a spell check. But some words and phrases do end up slipping through our fingers, and that does make or break some sentiment analysis models.
Now, regardless, we've caught that, and now we were able to condense that original tweet into the four words that you see on the bottom there. Now that we've cleaned our tweets, we can associate the word vectors and gloves to each word. And now, again, we have our numbers to word association and can now train our model. That's exactly what I did. Now, how is my model, you might be asking. How good was it? Well, luckily for the safety of the internet world as we know it, I wasn't that successful. My model reached around a 60% accuracy, which meant that it was able to correctly identify the sentiments of around 60% of the sentences that I gave it. However, considering that this is a problem that has yet to be solved, this number is a sign of hope for things to come. Now, throughout this talk, you might have been asking yourself, why do we care? Who asked Andy? What's next? And I'm here to tell you this. It's true. This technology is bringing us ever so closer to our inevitable robot overlord world. But I still believe that this technology is imperative and essential to our technological development for the benefits that it can provide. Now, currently, the applications of sentiment analysis are purely commercial. We see movie producers using sentiment analysis to evaluate audience feedback on their recent projects. We see corporations including this technology to assess how consumers are reacting to their products. But in the future, as this technology gets better, we can see that this technology can be applied to a myriad of problems. For example, sentiment analysis could be used to provide help for people with mental health issues. Many people with these issues find refuge in the internet. And so with this technology, we'll be able to provide help for people that might have been reluctant to seek it. Furthermore, this technology could be used to gauge radicalism on the internet. As the internet has become a hub for radicalization, we can see that this technology can be used by governments to make the internet safer for us all. And hey, if that didn't reach all of you, then maybe our phones can become our therapists one day. Hey Siri, how am I doing? Thank you. <laughs>